today I've got a green man design that I drew onto my fabric here. This is again going to be another bag. I used one of these uh, blue uh, water wash water erasable markers. This is a clover brand and just drew it on. Now a lot of the quilting that I do I can do without having any marking at all, but something like this where it really needs to look like something when it's done, I'll actually do all the drawing first. That way I don't lose track of where I'm going as I'm working around. You're only you know looking at one space and it becomes a little harder to get a realistic looking design. So I've done that. Let me turn this around so that in the camera it looks right side up. And uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quilt over that. I'll do all of that first. And basically the needle uh, will simply follow those lines as close as I can. And it doesn't have to be perfect because this is going to wash out. So after it's done, I'll, uh, well, a lot of people will use a spray, a spray bottle with water in it to uh, get that out. Uh, some people will wipe it with a damp cloth, uh, and those will usually do the trick. What I'm going to do is uh, soak it in some cold water, and uh, the reason that I do that is then I know for sure that it's all out. What happens sometimes is this, this pen uh, has uh, a tendency to saturate into the fabric, and it might even end up, a little bit of it might even end up in the batting, and uh, if you don't really get it all out, it can reappear. So what I do is I just soak in cold water and that gets it out. Or you can even throw it into the washing machine and do a rinse cycle on cold. What you don't want to do is get any soap in it or any hot water because that will actually set the ink. Uh, but if you're careful and you do this right, it'll come right out. So I'll do all of that. And then in the background areas, I'm going to do very small uh, pebble stitches. You could also do this by stippling. And what that does is it, it uh, creates a greater contrast between the design and the background and that makes the design stand out more. So between following the lines and I'm going to use a contrasting thread and stippling the background, we should get some pretty good definition on the design. I'm using uh, my Singer, one of my Singer 66 treadles. It is um, a newer uh, version of it, so uh, a lot of people have an old uh, Singer 66, the, particularly the Red Eye version, and uh, they have not this standard side clamping foot where the, there's the screw on the side that your foot fits on. They have the kind where the screw is actually in the back and different feet. So if you have one of those, they do sell a little converter piece that slides over and can uh, make that work. Um, you can also change out the presser bar for a new one uh, and that'll work as well. Um, the basic setup of the machine is the same. Uh, regardless of the age. If it's a Singer 66, it'll work. Now, I have today, uh, this is the foot I'm going to use, and, you know, the hooks on there and the side. This goes over the dusty, the needle clamp, and it makes the foot do just a little jumping as the needle goes up and down and that will keep the pressure off of the feed dogs enough that you can do your movements and get the free motion quilting to work. So even though it's an old machine and I can't drop the feed dogs with a, with a, uh, with a foot that works and uh, this one is from an old uh, PATH machine, they make there's several versions that are available. Singer makes one that's, uh, or, you know, and there's several generic versions. But the idea is that there's a bar that goes over the needle 
and it makes this hop. I don't know, I just I started using this one. I, you know, I had it for the other machine and I decided to try it on the Singer and it works great. Um, so, anyway, they're available. This is an old vintage one that I got on eBay, uh, but again, the, uh, the, the type like this uh, in the uh, um, Singer category are available just about anywhere that sells quilting stuff. Um, check online, just type in, uh, for your search, type in uh, low shank darning foot and you'll come up with a bunch of options that, uh, that will probably work for your machine. So again, treadle machine doesn't have to be. You can use any kind of machine and it'll still work. Here's the thread I'm going to use. I want a, uh, a, a good contrast. I could do this also with a, a matching thread and then the only uh, real thing that would show would be the, the texture that's created. And that works beautifully too, but I I think the person that I'm making this for will appreciate the green. And this is a, a heavier than quilting weight fabric. It's kind of like a um, gabardine type. This is uh, polyester batting and regular cotton quilting fabric for the back. Um, let's see, this batting is uh, soft and bright. On some quilts, I'll actually use two layers of this uh, batting, and it makes for a, uh, a bigger uh, loft when you're quilting, and that shows it up off even better. So that's all about the setup. Let's see, I've also got, uh, I don't know if you can see this, this is a uh, LED light that um, has a magnet on it that I can clamp to the, or I can just pop onto the machine and it sticks, and then I can get my uh, my light right where I need it because these old machines of course don't have uh, lights on them and I've also got a uh, an ot light here that I can bend in real close if I need it um, the older I get the more light I need when I quilt so having an extra source of light is pretty helpful. So anyway, that's all the setup. I'll uh, get this machine threaded and show you some of the actual quilting in just a bit. <clears throat> okay, I got the machine threaded with, this is 40 weight cotton, uh, Presencia thread, and that's the brand name. And I love cotton. 40 weight for machine quilting. One thing that you will find with it though, gotta pull this bobbin thread up. One thing you'll find with it is that um, it's linty and you will get fuzz around your needle and you'll have to clean it, uh, the machine out periodically. Uh, so it's a little more linty than uh, some of the other threads, but I like it for its definition. It shows up nicely. It's, uh, it's a nice thread to work with. And uh, anyway, so a lot of people use a much thinner thread than a 40 weight, but it's really my preference because it really shows. One of the things that you're going to have to work with is making sure that your, uh, you got to get these thread tails out of the way, making sure that your tension is <coughs> set at uh, a uh, proper uh, tension for your particular machine and you know everyone is different and you're going to have to play with it. You don't have the magic answer because it's different with every project and yeah, I just broke my thread. But 
I think you can see how uh, um, how it stands out. And I'm trying to I'm doing this upside down so that his face is up and facing you, and uh, so that's a little confusing. Uh, now let me get my machine re-threaded. I've got to cut the bottom thread and pull it up again here. What happens? I get uh, I get to talking and. Uh, on this machine, it wouldn't happen if it had a motor, but it happens that it's on a treadle, and if I push my foot in the wrong direction, it uh, spins the wheel the wrong way, and that causes the thread to break. Anyway, I think you can see what I'm doing is basically just following my drawing. Now I uh, I just draw these off the off the top of my head pretty much and uh, a lot of people have trouble with that. If you uh, if you need assistance there are plenty of Design books that you can get with open source clip art type images in it. You don't want to copy somebody's original work if it's copyrighted. And pretty much just assume that it is. You don't want to. You don't want to be tracing or copying somebody else's design without their written uh, consent. So, if you're going to uh, look for a design source to trace on your uh, fabric and, and do, the, do your quilting, make sure it's uh, one that's a free. Uh, pattern, not something that somebody may have uh, a copyright to, because that's essentially it's it's stealing if you don't uh, if you don't get permission. So anyway, there's lots of sources for patterns out there. You can trace them on. You can use your uh, you can use a copy machine to enlarge or reduce so that they fit your specific project. Uh, you may need to uh, use a light box to trace it on, or you can do what I did and just kind of make up your own and draw it on if you're. Uh, if you're unsure about your drawing, oh, I broke my thread again. If you're unsure about your drawing skills, um, it might be better to uh, start with just something simple and uh, just work your way up. I'm going to uh, do a little more, and I'll come back and show you uh, a little further along in a, in a few minutes. Okay, I've got all the quilting done on the on the guy's face. I'll go back again and you know wash out the extra marker. It'll stand out better. Uh, but now I'm going to do this rope border, and then we'll do some filling in. Now I do I do this with quite a bit of overlapping. So, and I don't know if it's going to show with the angle of the camera here, but you see how it's 
sort of a back and forth. Teflon uh, mat that makes the quilt slide as I'm uh, as I'm quilting, and that prevents me from needing to wear gloves, and it makes the quilt just slide beautifully, and makes my job a lot easier. And lots of people think, oh, it's they're so they're expensive and I can use something else. And then they go to the dollar store and buy a placemat or some sort of a uh, item out of the cooking department where it's a non-stick surface for cookie sheets. And they uh, claim that they're the same thing. And I would tell you, no, they aren't. These uh, that are designed for machine quilting you have a sticky surface on the back, but it's not a sticky surface that makes a mess. Uh, it's just a little slightly tacky and it keeps it from sliding so you don't have to tape it down or anything. If it gets windy on the back and stops sticking, it's just a matter of taking it to the sink and rinsing it off and letting it dry, and it's back to uh, back to work. And they are slicker and work better than other solutions. So, and they last for a long time. And when you think about the amount of time effort it saves you, I think they are well worth the investment. So, I have two now so I can switch them around more easily uh, and not have to, you know, I have 40 different, 40-ish like machines and several of them set up at once. So I do go through uh, you know, from machine to machine, just depending on what I'm selling and what mood I'm in. Anyway, so I have some extra. So now you, I think you can see there's the rope border. Now the, the next step is to do the very small um, stippling uh, or pebble uh, finish inside. I just did want to show you. Let me see if I can get it. See that? That's some of the lint from the thread. So one of the things that while you're working that you might want to keep track of is that you let you get these little wads out because what can happen, it doesn't very often, but what has happened in the past is I've gotten on a roll and one of these falls off and gets stitched in and then you're going to have to pick it out. So get rid of those little lint balls uh, before they get too big. So then we have the little, and I do circles. Uh, you can do the sort of meandering stippling stitch as well. Uh, but what's going to happen by doing this is it's going to make the design that I did stand out more. Time consuming, and it takes a lot of prep. Um, the other thing that I didn't mention about the setup on this particular machine 
And again, it's going to vary from machine to machine, but this one prefers to have the top and bottom thread matching. They don't have to match in color, but they should be the same type of thread. It's easier to get a good balanced stitch on this machine when the top thread and bottom thread are the same. So I'm, I'm just using the same thread. I could, if I wanted, use a different color. Uh, you know, if I got a better deal on white thread, I might use that in the, in the bobbin and the colored thread on top. Or if I wanted it to look different on front and back, I could do that. But it is, on this machine, important that the, the bobbin thread and the top thread are the same thickness. And um, I am using a pretty big needle. This is a uh, 100. Uh, let's see. I've, I've done this, this thread weight with a 9014, and this one is a 100. And I can't remember what the other number is. This is a 12 or is it a 16? Anyway, it's a 100. Uh, Schmetz regular needle. Um, you may find, depending on your fabric and your thread, you may find, and I've had good luck with, a top stitch needle. And I've also had, on heavier fabrics, had good luck with a jeans needle. But one of the things that I found, and what I do, uh, and it really doesn't matter what fabric it is, that uh, what I have found is a bigger needle is a lot easier. The, uh, the bigger needle has a bigger hole in it, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't chew up the thread. Sometimes you try a needle that's too small and you keep getting shredding thread or breaking thread. And now I was, my thread was breaking a lot earlier broke it twice, uh, but I haven't broke it since, and I I think it was just because of what I was doing, and I was pulling the machine the wrong way, and trying to talk and sew at the same time. But anyway, a bigger needle, for me, is usually the answer. down to a 9014, but that's the smallest needle I've ever used for quilting. When I, when I try something smaller, it just doesn't seem to work. And I'm not a big fan of the needles that they say are quilting needles. Uh, they just they don't do much for me. And uh, I have used and had good luck with Microtex needles got a different kind of a point to it, a different uh, eye configuration. Um, but they're, they're, uh, they're more expensive. And, but they work. But again, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to play with different needles and figure out what combination of thread, needle, and fabric works best for your project, because it's not always the same. The, uh, the, the needle uh, is dependent, or what, what the best needle is, really is dependent on the thread and the machine and the, uh, the fabric and the batting and how fast you're quilting. I mean, there's just so many factors. So it's a good idea to, uh, to have an assortment to try. But again, in my experience, what has always been the answer is, if it's not working and you keep getting, having problems, just put in a bigger needle. I don't know if everybody else uh, has the same Experience, but that's mine. Big needle. 
relatively slow speed and uh, practice first. Okay, get a get a piece of the fabric that you're going to be using in your project and the backing and the batting, not the actual project, but a sample piece. Put it together and test it out. And you will be able to see how it's going to work. You'll be able to do all your tension adjustments and uh, get the right needle and the, all the settings good um, before you get too involved and have to tear stuff out on your real project. So it's, I think it's a good idea to have, have a test piece and, and do some, some practice before you get going. Because you will have to do some adjusting from project to project. Again, because you're going to have different thread, you're going to have different fabric, you're going to have different batting, and they do behave differently. So there's the, uh, the basic motif, and then more of this pebble quilting on the outside. And on the outside, it'll be a little bigger, because I don't, I don't need uh, as much definition. But you see how that quilting brings the design out, and it really changes the color overall, the look of the, of the background, and that makes this look more uh, prominent. So I'm going to uh, keep on quilting and I'll do the background and then I'll uh, rinse off the, the wash away ink marks and I'll show you what it looks like when it's done. <coughs> well there it is. <coughs> I, uh, I just made it with four bobbins of uh, thread and uh, I think it turned out pretty good. Let me zoom a little bit. So there's the there's the front of what will become a a bag, a, kind of like a tote bag. Um, I'm going to do same fabric, same thread on the back. And I don't know if this will show, but what I did is I just basic outline sort of shapes of leaves and 
they'll get more detail as I as I quilt them, uh, and that'll be the other side of the of the bag. It sort of coordinates because the Green Man uh, is essentially made up of leaves. So this will be the the reverse side, and I'll basically do it the same way. Quilt around those leaves. I'll put the veins in and make these edges more jagged and then the whole background will get filled with uh, the type of uh, quilting that I did on this and then it gets sewed together the two sides together and box corners and um, the top goes under a little bit gets folded down and uh, straps get attached and then a zipper closure and we're done so uh, let me uh, let me quilt up this side and I'll show you what it looks like. Okay, this is the other side and I've got one leaf done. And I don't know if you can see the additional uh, detail I put in it compared to what I just quickly sketched on to the uh, to the fabric. So what I'm going to do, since all this background is going to be filled in with those little circles, that little pebble stitch, what I'm going to do is do some of that stitching uh, to travel over to the next part where I need to do uh, the next leaf. And what I could do is uh, lift up the foot, cut off the thread, and then restart and just do all the, uh, the quilting around the leaves and then come back and do the background. But rather than stop and start and have extra thread ends, I just am going to, you know, sort of travel across so that I don't have extra places where I have to stop and start and have additional ends to tie off. So that gets me, and the whole background will be filled in with this. So that, anyway, that gets me to the to the bottom of this leaf where I'll do the stem and uh, then that just prevents me from having to, again, I don't have to stop and start. The more you can do without having to change the thread or restart or cut it off, you know, pretty much if you can do everything in one giant long non-stopping motion, uh, it, it makes your life easier. So what you can see, I think, I hope, is that the lines that I drew on with that wash away marker are really just there to help me get the basic shape. And with my quilting, I'm adding this sort of serrated edge that makes it look more like a natural leaf. And I could have been much more deliberate in my drawing and made it look just right, just like a leaf to begin with, but it's frankly much easier for me to just do a basic shape just to get my placement right and then sort of do some free motion kind of stuff to, to just add the detail while I'm going. If are a little hesitant to do that kind of make it up as you go sort of stuff. There's nothing that says you couldn't draw exactly everything that you want to uh, uh, get quilted first. There's you know there's no reason that you couldn't do that, uh, but 
I just find it easier to uh, just do a basic shape and then do the quilting. Now, I don't have very much uh, past this one. This, this will end up being the bottom of the bag once it's constructed, so I don't really need to put any, anything fancy there. I am going to do all this pebble quilting all over it to fill it in, and, and uh, this heavy quilting adds, um, adds some stiffness to the fabric, and it actually makes it work better as a bag. Now I'm just going to work some of this pebble quilting along the edges and work my way over to the next leaf. And then of course when it's all done, when, I, when, I, when I've worked my way around and filled in or, or completed all the, the leaf portions, then I'll work my way back in between everything and complete filling in the pebbles. So here I am at the next one. I work my way up the main stem, back down, and down here where the uh, the main part of the stem is. I make it uh, sort of a double layer or a double thickness. doing the serrated edges. Again, I don't have to follow those lines exactly. I'm sort of changing it up as I go a little bit to improve the shape. Give it a more natural look. One of the things that I like about doing it this way, rather than drawing one and then tracing it, is that they all come out different. And if you, if you look at real leaves, they're not ever going to be two that are exactly the same. And this way, I get a variety. They all look sort of the same, but they're, they're not perfectly uniform and equal, so that to me has a more natural look to it. And I think when things are not perfectly uniform and even and uh, have a little variety to them, that makes them not look like they were made in a factory. You know, I'm all for beautiful and perfect as much as I can do it, but I am, I am not a computerized machine and I don't want it to look like that. I want it to look individual. I want it to look like it was made by human hands. Even though I'm doing this with a machine, it's still all controlled by me. So, you know, there are, there are people who, uh, who will say, oh, it's cheating to use a machine. You should do everything by hand. And, uh, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I used to be one of the hand quilting uh, sort of snobs and thought that hand quilting is better uh, because it's the way they always used to do it and it's the traditional way to do it and it takes more effort 
and uh, I will tell you that it does, hand folding does take more time, but I don't know if it takes more skill. Um, learning to free motion flow and get it to look uh, the way you want it to is not something that is does not require skill. It's a different skill than uh, hand folding for sure. But it's certainly not easy. And it's not something that uh, happens overnight where you sit down and all of a sudden you're an expert in machine quilter. It takes skill on the most expensive, fancy, deluxe machine. It takes skill and practice to, uh, to make something look right and to do uh, the, uh, the quilting. So, machine quilting, definitely not cheating. I'm definitely in control of the design and every stitch is done by me. The machine is helping me to do that, but it's not doing it for me. The other thing I want people to realize is that, you know, this is a, this is a no frills. works. It gets the job done. It's not to say that you shouldn't buy a fancy machine if that's what you want, but I want you to know that you don't need to have one if you want to be able to do free motion quilting. So, anyway, I'm not uh, trying to say that you shouldn't Machine quilt, or sorry, you shouldn't hand quilt. You uh, certainly, uh, I still admire and find hand quilting to be quite beautiful. It's a different look. I still want to do it someday when my hands don't hurt so much and my uh, shoulders and my elbow don't hurt so much when I do it. I will get back to hand quilting, but for now, I am able to do, even with, even with my arthritic fingers and thumbs, I'm able to do machine quilting. very much. Uh, but I will tell you, just like hand quilting, the first time I tried it, I found it not to be a very enjoyable process. I found it to be frustrating. I would be essentially swearing at the machine and screaming and kept thinking to myself, how could anybody possibly enjoy this? This is not fun, this is work. And when I, uh, when I look back on it now, I had the exact same experience when I was learning how to hand quilt. I didn't find it enjoyable until I got good at it. And so I think Machine quilting is the same. Like any skill, you're not going to feel competent at it or find it to be real enjoyable until you do it enough that it becomes second nature and not something that you have to uh, 
stress out over and worry about and think about. When you do it enough, any activity becomes something that you, you do and you do think about it, but almost subconsciously. Think about when you first learned how to drive and you had to think about the gas pedal and you had to think about the brakes and you had to think about how or do I push the pedal to uh, increase my speed? Uh, how do I ease up on the pedal to maintain my speed? How hard do I push the brakes at this various stop? You were thinking and thinking and thinking all the time when you first started doing it, and now all those things happen without having to give it really a thought at all. If you actually started to think about it, you'd probably get a little confused. Like, um, uh, try to explain that, all those steps to someone. Because you don't think about them anymore, it just has become second nature. Anyway, the I, my, my point being, that's sort of what happens with any... Uh, oh, I ran out of bobbin. So it's time to stop. Uh, but anyway, that's sort of what happens with any, um, with any task. You, uh, you start out having to really give it a lot of thought and think about exactly what you're doing. Over time, it becomes something that you do without thinking. Uh, it's just your brain is trained to do that, your, your hands, your feet, you have a, a, some people call it muscle memory, where it just becomes part of your subconscious. You just know that's what you're doing and you're not consciously thinking about it. What I'm thinking about is not what my hands are doing, not what my feet is doing, not what really necessarily what the machine is doing, but I just look at that needle and start, you know, figuring out where I want to go next, and it just sort of seems to happen. I don't really have to think about all the things of uh, um, how fast the machine is going, how fast I'm moving my hands, how to make decent looking stitches. It all just sort of happens by itself almost because I've done it a lot. So once you've done it a lot, you'll feel. I think the same way that um, uh, that it just is sort of a subconscious thing that that your your hands and your feet and uh, everything knows what to do, and then it's just a matter of the design that you want to make. So, anyway, I'm going to finish this side up. I'll show you the finished thing, and then I'll uh, uh, start building a bag out of it. So. While I was working on this background, um, I thought of something else I wanted to talk about a little bit, and that is creating or developing your own personal style. And I guess um, it's sort of hard to even describe that, uh, but I'll give it a go. For years, I was a floral design instructor, and I had hundreds and hundreds of students over, over a course of a number of years. And in the beginning, basic classes, we did uh, many, many projects, and the way it would work is I would give every student the exact same bucket full of flowers, and I would do a demonstration of how to create the project for the day. And after I demonstrated, they would copy. And the goal was to make theirs look as much as possible just like mine. 
that was the basic uh, class, is you're learning by copying. You're learning by, you know, seeing and recreating. And it's a, it's a good skill to have. Um, in the advanced floral design class, we would all, all the students would get a bucket of flowers, all the same. And I would not demonstrate all the time exactly what we were going to make first. We would just talk about it and explore the options of what you could make or how you would approach the project with those given materials. And I would have the students make their own. And while they were making theirs, I would make mine. And then we would all talk about it after it was done. And in that case, every uh, floral design that was created was different. And that's what I'd like to uh, encourage you to do. Start out, if you need to, uh, to gain skills, you start out by copying. But as time goes by, I'd like you to expand that to your own style. Because I think that's when it gets to be fun. You know, copying, creating uh, something that's just exactly the same as something else you've seen, initially, that's fine. That's how you learn. But I can tell you from experience in both floral design and in quilting that when you get uh, beyond that and you're not copying and making something up out of your own mind, it is so much more rewarding. And when I make something, whatever it is, a, a bag, a quilt, uh, a piece of machine embroidery, um, whatever it is, it's always in my mind that I want it to look like me, like I made it, like it's, it's unique to something that I did. I don't want it to look like anybody else's. And uh, so that's always my, my goal. And it becomes so much it's kind of free when you say, okay, I don't have to make it exactly like that. I don't, I don't, I don't have to make it a perfect replica to make it good. I think it's actually better when what you make is not a perfect replica of what somebody else made. Be that in your quilting or in the selection of fabrics that you can use for a piece of quilt uh, or, or anything. Make it your own. So learn to do by copying, that's fine. But then take it, you just ran out of bobbin thread, but then take it past that. You learn, you, you copy what somebody does and shows you how to do, and that's how you learn, and then you take it past that and you put in your own uh, spin on it. Not all the same leaves, make them different. Uh, put them in a different position, use different fabric, use different thread. Uh, this background uh, quilting that I do, uh, you might use a different pattern. There's several uh, videos on YouTube about how to make a different background pattern or to, oh, I got a piece of lint stuck in there, uh, how to make it with uh, uh, different designs. Um, Combine, uh, combine different ideas together into one piece. So you don't have to, I'm not telling you not to copy, uh, but I'm telling you not to be afraid to move beyond that. Because I find, for me anyway, 
that's when it gets uh, more rewarding, is when I put myself into it, not somebody else. So it becomes mine and not a copy of somebody else's. It's, I guess the, uh, another uh, comparative analogy would be that it's, it's, uh, it's like the difference between uh, painting a painting and painting a paint by number. They both take some skills. They both are, uh, are, end up being a painting, but one is, is, is different than the other. And I think that when you do uh, your own, there's more reward to it. And I think they're better. So anyway, that's my, that's my two cents about you know, trying to create your own style. It's that um, when, you, uh, when you work towards having your own uh, style, um, it's freeing. You get, uh, you get to, uh, well, basically you get to do whatever you want. And I, I think that uh, in itself makes it more uh, enjoyable. So I'm winding a bobbin here, just one second. So don't, um, don't feel that um, yours has to look exactly like mine if you're, if you're trying to quilt along. Uh, I would encourage you not to make it look exactly like mine. Um, put in your own, your own uh, take on it. And uh, again, yeah, I think it feels more rewarding to do that. So I'm going to get this bobbin in and uh, it's the only problem with these uh, silicone mats is that it becomes difficult to get your your bobbin in without taking out the, the cover there and I'm gonna have to move it uh, so anyway just food for thought try to be unique and I'll show you the finished product in a bit so after several hours of quilting trying to put it all together uh, I'll show you the finish the, the bag is complete, the green man on that side, the uh, maple leaves on that side, uh, nice long straps, zipper closure, uh, a nice bright lining with pockets, and that is how it turned out. So anyway, I think it's a nice tote bag. Happy quilting.